From the time she was 10 years old, 34-year-old Alexandra Jones suffered from treatment-resistant depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. And in that time span, no therapy, medicine, or treatment could help. That is, until one day, a trip in Jamaica changed all of that. Not a trip to Jamaica, a trip in Jamaica. <laughs> Therapeutically guided trip on psilocybin mushrooms. <laughs> she told Michael all of the PEW trust said it saved her life. You know, when a dear legalization activist buddy of mine first told me about this power that psilocybin holds, I wrote it off as a bunch of hippie nonsense. I only started listening when he told me about its efficacy in treating certain mental health disorders. This interests me because I got pretty severe anxiety and a panic disorder. And I'd be willing to bet many people here have struggles of their own because the mental, National Alliance for Mental Illness estimates that nearly 75% of college students experience a mental health crisis during college. My friends, today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that hidden power of psilocybin got before going into detail about some of the shady reasons behind its illegalization and warped public perception. At the end of the day, though, when the misconceptions are clear, I want to impress on you that psilocybin remains no joke. First, though, before all of that, what even is psilocybin? Well, the Alcohol and Drug Foundation explains that psilocybin is the principal component found in magic mushrooms, which upon ingestion produces psychoactive effects. Its usage dates to prehistory, can be found on every continent but Antar Antarctica. It's not considered to be addictive, and its physical effects are so minor that they're not even relevant to the discussion at hand. The true power of psilocybin is cerebral. According to neuropsychologist Dr. Ben Sessa at the Imperial College of London, psilocybin acts on the serotonin receptors and disrupts the default mode network, which is the area of the brain associated with the ego, the perception of self. By disrupting it, psilocybin forces the brain to create all sorts of new neural connections and pathways that it would with the ego's pushback. In short, it enables you to let go and be open to the possibility of change. It is this psychological flexibility which mediates healing outcomes in therapeutic environments. In fact, a study led by Dr. Michael Bogenschutz of the University of New Mexico found that just two sessions of psilocybin therapy were a strong predictor that active alcoholics, by and large, would see a significant decrease in their use of and desire to use alcohol for up to five weeks. A similar study performed by Dr. Albert Garcia Rameau at Johns Hopkins found that 80% of 60 smokers addicted to tobacco remained abstinent for six months after just three sessions of psilocybin therapy. Perhaps most strikingly, though, a third study led by Dr. Natalie Dukasian and Alan Davis at Johns Hopkins saw 75% of 24 participants with severe depression exhibit clinical reductions in their symptoms for 12 months after just two sessions of psilocybin therapy. 58% of participants were in remission of all symptoms. And you know what? If you're not impressed, here's five of 22 more studies I found the exact same or very similar to this. So, if psilocybin is so conducive to healing, why is it legal? And why are we so afraid? Well, under the Controlled Substances Act, the DEA has psilocybin listed as a Schedule I substance. Schedule I substances are those with no medical use, a high potential for abuse, and no accepted safety under medical supervision. All of this, of course, is contrary to research. The DEA's website lists only psilocybin's worst and rarest effects. Of course, there's something more going on. In the late 1960s, President Richard Nixon saw his toughest opposition from the anti-Vietnam War left. Psychedelic, drug-using, counterculture hippies and their charismatic leaders. Make no mistake, the war on drugs that Nixon kickstarted was not a war on drugs. It was a war on political opposition. The Controlled Substances Act of 1970 listed several drugs, psilocybin included, as Schedule I and therefore illegal. By criminalizing, vilifying and misrepresenting psychedelics, Nixon kicked down the doors of those types who would oppose them and throw them in jail, all while appearing to do it in the name of public health and safety. All of this, all of this was confessed to by Nixon's own assistant for domestic affairs, Mr. John Ehrlichman, in a 1992 interview with Wall Street journalist Dan Baum, who published the whole story in his 1997 book, Smoke and Mirrors. The actions of the Nixon administration have suppressed vital information and sown only confusion among the populace. The, the danger that is hyperbolized with the DEA and Controlled Substances Act can be controlled in the proper setting. 
as we've covered, psilocybin is immensely powerful. Effectively, it rewires the brain and leaves it open to all sorts of new ideas, feelings, thoughts, and might even bring up repressed memories. Naturally, some of these can be a little scary. This is exactly why environmental stimuli ought to be conducive to a calm state of mind. Data collected by Dr. Henry Lowe at the University of the West Indies found that the safest and most productive psilocybin trips were done in areas that were physically safe, comfortable, supportive, and professionally supervised, like Alexander Jones' trip. Anything else can have disastrous results. Uncontrolled settings with uneducated people are prone to producing what is known as a bad trip. Bad trips are characterized by extreme fear, paranoia, distress, a disconnection from reality, and existential dread. A survey of 1992 recreational psilocybin users conducted by Dr. Teresa Cardinaro at Johns Hopkins saw that 61% of them ranked their bad trip as within the top 10 most difficult, frightening, challenging experiences of their life. 39% the top five, and within that 39%, 11% said that their bad trip was the single most difficult, frightening, and challenging experience of their life. Three of the 1992 attempted suicide on their bad trip, and another three exhibit signs associated with the onset of psychosis. Despite the fact that 84% of them endorsed having somehow benefited from the experience, the risk they took was incurred because of a lack of understanding about psilocybin, and that risk was massive. Because psilocybin is no joke. Its potential is huge, and it can heal you just as lastingly and effectively as it can harm you. It's not a party, but neither is it the anti-American guaranteed life destroyer that the government will have you believe. So my friends, I hope I've cleared the air surrounding psilocybin for you just a bit, but if you remember one thing from today, remember not to take things at face value, because there might be a little bit, or a lot, in the service.